Well, my wife, Meredith, and I, we're basketball fans, and our team is the Golden State Warriors. Uh, hey, we got some other Warrior fans out here. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, but I, I think, you know, I've, I played a little bit of basketball when I was younger, but we got into it together, I think, when our son, Nate, was up at Scotts Valley High School, and he played four years of basketball up there. And so we would go to these games. We got into it. And ever since then, we, we just love basketball. It's something that we share in together. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's high school, college, the G League, and I wish they were playing again. Uh, the Warriors were watching on TV. We just love them. But the, the thing that's kind of interesting is both of us now, um, from the couch, uh, we can identify good plays and bad plays. We'll just say, wow, did you see that? That was incredible. Or, why did he shoot that? And what a horrible pass. It's like, come on, catch the ball. And, and so we're critiquing. In essence, we're coaching from the couch. Uh, that's what we're doing. And if either one of us watches a game with the other one not there and we reconnect, we usually ask, hey, how'd the Warriors do? And the response is, Either we won or we lost. You get that? We. It's like, what do we have to do with it? Nothing. We're just sitting on the couch watching other people get paid an extraordinary amount of money to have a whole bunch of fun. And uh, I think they call this fan identification. But the reason I share this, because just as much as there's fan identification in sports, and as I shared, that's our sport. Your sport may be something different, but typically we all have it. Maybe yours is bowling. That's okay. Um, but there's a fan identification. And I think there's um, also fan identification with Christianity as well. I mean, it's easy to sit on the couch to observe, to, to see a good play and call it, and to see a bad play and call that as well. And that's what um, James is going to be talking to us about this morning as we get into chapter 2 of the book of James. See, here's, here's what it is when it comes to sports, um, and this series is Marks of Maturity, but when it comes to sports, you know, an inexperienced player uh, will really talk a lot about the game, but can't even play the game. And so it is in Christianity, an immature person and that's what we're looking at, all these marks of maturity. An immature person will talk about their faith, talk about their beliefs, but it, it is the mature Christian who actually lives their faith. I have heard it said before that you only believe as much of the Bible as you practice. You only believe as much of the Bible as you practice. The goal is not to get into the Word of God, to read it and study it and memorize it. That's not the goal. The goal is to get the Word of God into you that you would begin living it. And if you read it and you don't obey it, obviously you don't believe it. Um, and so that's what James is addressing here in chapter 2. You may want to uh, begin to turn there in your Bibles. Um, and really, the, the message, not only today, but also tomorrow, in, uh, or not next Sunday, in uh, chapter 2, it's, it's all about faith. And to talking about the word, we'll see, is never a substitute for doing the word. Um, today's message, and I'm only going to, I've got two messages out of chapter 2 for us. Today is the impact that faith has upon our love. And therefore, the title is Face Impact on Love. And on a most basic level, those who profess a faith, a belief in Jesus Christ and his word, those who have received the Holy Spirit, and those who are growing in their faith are growing in their ability, in your ability, to love others. It is the mature Christian who is the loving Christian. And at the most basic level when it comes to love, the most bas basic level is this. It's how you view others, how you regard others, how you uh, interact with uh, and treat others, which we'll see today. So let's go right there. I'm, I'm speaking to James chapter 2, verse 1. James writes, he says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. 
And he just lays it out there, gives us this command, says, boom, you must not show favoritism. And of course, he's going to articulate and give us illustrations of that. But as we do there, let me just talk about favoritism and give you a definition for this. Favoritism is regarding or treating someone better or worse than others. You know, you line up some people, and all of a sudden, you're, you're treating some betters. You're given preferential treatment here. Um, you're, you're not treating others as good here. And he just says there's no room for that in the life of a living Christian, uh, of a living, loving Christian, put it that way. And um, we are taught in the scriptures to view others through the eyes of Christ, um, we are to, if there's any sort of judgment to be made or any sort of discernment to be made, it is, does this person know Jesus or not? Is this person a Christian or not? But regardless of the answer, there's room for love. If the person is a Christian, you accept them, you love them because Christ lives in them. If the person is not a Christian, you love them because Christ died for them. And that's what I think James wants the message to be, is how do we view people? Because we can get caught up in all kinds of other filters and how we see people, but the, the filter for the mature Christian is through the eyes of love, through the eyes of Jesus. And, and that makes Christ the link between, and should be the link between you and everyone else. And that link is a linkage of love. And what James will say now, after getting this point across, he will give us an illustration. Let's look at this in verse 2. Suppose, okay, here's a hypothetical, hypothetical situation. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. Presumably, these are strangers. They walk in. And you, and you can see there's a stark contrast between the, between the two of them. And they walk into your, into your meeting. They come to you. Now, verse 3, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothing, in other words, if you give preferential treatment to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. The question is, have you not discriminated among yourselves, and discrimination leads you to become a judge and become judges with evil thoughts. Wow. So let me, <laughs> let me break that down. And, and I got hung up on this a little bit. It's like evil thoughts. And I got to thinking that perhaps, and I'm pretty sure this is what the author means, you may have a different interpretation, but this is what I see it as. An evil thought is a selfish thought. And just based on somebody's appearance, you're giving somebody this preferential treatment, expecting something in return. Maybe this person could do something for me. This is a person that appears to have a lot of assets. This is a person that might be able to help me out. So let me go ahead and give preferential treatment to this person. Whereas this person here, obviously this person has nothing to offer me, and so why should I invest in this person? Um, and the question I have for you that I think James has for you is do you cater to people, do you cater to an impression of people thinking that you might get something out of it? The term that I've used in this in my life, do you suck up to people? You know, and James just says there's no room for that. If you're a brother or sister in the Lord and you're following Jesus, there is absolutely no room for this in your life. That is indeed a mark of maturity. When you're at that place where you can regard all people as the same, that's a great indicator that you're, you're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. See, here's what we know about Jesus is this, is that Jesus never looked at the outward appearance. He always looked at the heart, always he never got caught up in the outward appearance. That's why you may recall the time when offerings were being given, and there at the street corner with a big kettle, um, there was uh, the Pharisees coming, and they were putting large sums of money in this kettle. And everybody was impressed except Jesus. And then you see this widow come along and put in two copper coins, and nobody was impressed except Jesus. 
And you can just see that. Jesus was looking at the heart for the for the wealthy Pharisees gave out of their abundance, but this poor widow gave out of her need. And he saw the heart uh, within her. Jesus, not being impressed with riches or social status, put him in a place where the elite did not appreciate this about him at all. They thought they were something special. Everybody on a human basis treated them differently. And here's Jesus, he did not. And so he, in some regard, took a lot of their wrath because of that. There's an interesting um, incident that took place. It's when the, um, when the uh, Pharisees tried to trap Jesus and ask him the question about, should you, pay the royal, or should you pay the tax to Caesar or not? It's in Matthew 22. Uh, it's insightful. Let me share this. This is verse 15 of Matthew 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, Jesus, and his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others. And get this, this is just a barb, it's a sting. Because you pay no attention to who they are. And this, is, this hurt them and so they're, in essence, mocking Jesus over this. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Um, you know, I, and I think with Jesus, he knew the Pharisees. He knew all of them. They, had, they were the ones who were the, uh, I guess they, they held the word of God. They taught the word of God. They studied the word of God. If anybody should have known God and received God, and I've been able to identify the Messiah, it was them. They had obviously rejected Jesus. And having rejected Jesus, there was no longer any hope for them. But Jesus, when he interacted with people, he would see the conditions of people's hearts. He would see sinners, and he always saw potential. Think about this when he came across Simon. Simon was one of these guys, right, in the crowd. He was obnoxious. He was a know-it-all. He was a braggart. He would be the guy that, you know, would probably, for the most part, be a little bit repulsive, would really be, you know, a lot of rough edges around Peter. But Jesus saw in Peter, he's the guy that's going to be a, a core leader in my church. He would become a rock. And even Jesus saw that. He changed his name to, from Simon to Peter. Think about Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, meaning he cooperated with the Roman government who was deeply hated. They mistreated the Jews. And he abandoned his heritage and became partners with the Romans. He was hated by everybody, but Jesus saw him as one who would be very faithful, who would ultimately be the author of one of the Gospels. Think about in John chapter 4, the woman at the well in Sychar. This woman was an immoral lady, having to get her water at the hottest part of the day because um, she probably didn't want to be seen too much in public. And Jesus knew all about her past, but knew that throughout her life she's, been tr she's had a void and she's tried to fill it again and again and again. And Jesus knew that if she were to only to receive him, his living water, he saw the potential in her as an evangelist. And sure enough, she led her whole village to the Lord. Jesus always saw that. The question comes out of this is, are you prone to judge people by their past? Or by their potential. You know, the fine clothes, the shabby clothes coming in, you're going to see, okay, well, that person's past, let them to this place. That person's past, let them to there. Is that the judgment we make? No. Jesus always looked potential. He saw potential. He saw that people are lost and in need of a shepherd. He saw that people were wandering in need of, of guidance. He saw people's hearts that were rocks and needed to be turned into hearts of flesh. He saw all of this, and that's how he treated everybody. I got to tell you a story, and um, it's kind of a disgusting story, okay? Let me get that out there on the front end. It's disgusting, and you're going to agree. Yeah, that's disgusting. But um, I live, my, Meredith and I live in the at, down at the harbor. We rent a little apartment right now. So to go to work, we go down our street, turn on Eaton, go across the, um, 
you know, the bridge there by the harbor and then work my way down to Ocean Street and come up Ocean right to 17. And so Monday morning, it's a little bit before 8 o'clock, I'm, I'm driving up Ocean Street, there's people out walking, there's plenty of cars, there's traffic in both directions, and as I'm looking ahead, I'm like, could that be? And I see somebody with their pants down around their, their shoes, and the person um, kind of squatting as though they're sitting on a toilet that isn't there. And as I get closer, I see it's a woman, and I see her with a newspaper in her left hand wiping her bottom. I just thought, that's disgusting. <laughs> but then as I got past her, I began to think about what would bring a person to that place in their life? Was it mental health issues? What happened in her past to allow this? What difference would there be in this woman if Jesus took up residency there? And I was just heartbroken. I couldn't get this woman out of my mind just thinking. And her plight is multiplied how many times over um, with what's going on with so many people. This is why, I can tell you this, when people walk into our office, we call them walk-ins, and they're looking for help. And these are people that are down and out. They're destitute. And I guarantee you, every one of our pastors, and I'm so proud of them, they will take the time to meet, and we just, we're not going to just give you a gas cart or a food voucher or whatever. We're going to talk to you, do you know Jesus? Because whatever got you to where you are today, where you have to beg, I can tell you, Jesus can get you on the right path. And so we continually share Jesus. It's why we do a food ministry here. If we can catch people before they get to that point and help them out, I think we're doing a great good. And I'm, I can tell you on behalf of all those who work in the food ministry, when people come through the line, there is no judgment. We see all people as being lovable, and we love all people. Um, think about Jesus. Jesus was judged by human standards, and he was rejected. He didn't come from the right town. He came from Nazareth. And remember what the word about Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, he was labeled. He was judged. He didn't attend their rabbi schools, so he didn't get the right training. He was judged. He didn't have the official approval of all those in leadership, so he was judged. He had no wealth, so he was judged. And his followers were sinners. And I think Jesus looked through this, and I think this idea of favoritism really bothered him. So much so that his brother, James, takes this up and devotes half a chapter to it. And I've, I've just got to ask you, do you not enjoy certain people because they're not your kind of people? Can I, I tell you this? For the mature Christian, there should be nobody that falls into that category, not your kind of people. Jesus died for them all. Jesus died for them all. And understand, it's not compromise that propels you to love somebody. It's compassion that propels you, just like it was with Jesus. That's why Jesus in John 7, 24 said this, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. This is what James is trying to get across to us. Here, here's what I'd like to say. The mature Christian is not overly impressed or easily intimidated by wealth or markers of social standing such as attire, profession, or possessions. In other words, that's not how we're viewing the person. And I guess conversely, I don't have the blanks to fill in, in but conversely, the mature Christian is not overly dismissive or easily put off by a lack of wealth or a lack of the markers of social standing, such as attire, prof profession, or possessions. It's no, we're treating everybody equally. See, what it is, when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes up residency, dwells inside of you, and now you have the ability to look deeper within at others. That's what the ability you are given by God. Let me go back to James. James continues in verse uh, 5, and he says, and he asks four rhetorical questions. They come rapid fire. 
And rhetorical questions sometimes are very good at allowing your mind to recalibrate. And so what he says is this. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Of course, yes. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Well, yes. Um, Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Yes. Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the normal name of him Uh, to whom you belong? Yes. And James is just drawing this out. In other words, he's saying, so why are you showing them favoritism? Uh, You know, is is the next question not asked but implied. See, in that day it was easy, if you were a person of influence and a rich person, to exploit the poor, to influence decisions at the the court, and as a result, make yourself richer off of them. Uh, Unscrupulous rich people or people of influence could still be doing that today. That hasn't changed. That's human nature. But when you despise the poor, it's as though James is saying, I'm going to put you in the camp of the unscrupulous rich people taking advantage of others. You're doing the exact same thing. Verse 8, he goes on, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, that's the royal law, you are doing right. It's royal because it's given by the king. It's royal because it rules all other laws, this love others, or love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, to love your neighbor as yourself does not mean you have to agree with your neighbor or your neighbor's lifestyle or your neighbor's political affiliations, whatever. You don't have to agree. But not agreeing is no excuse not to love. Uh, Love means you treat others the way God treats them. The way God is constantly wanting to pour out his grace into their lives. God wants to accept them. God wants to forgive them. God wants to receive them. God sees their potential. That's what we're called to do. That's what this royal law is all about. The alternative to favoritism is love, James is saying. Verse 9 goes on to say, But if you show favoritism, you sin. These are are strong words. You sin, and you um, are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you... Do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder. You have become a lawbreaker, in essence, breaking all the laws. The question is, is favoritism serious? Yes. James jumps it in, or or lumps it in with adultery and murder. That's how serious this is. I think he understood that this most basic level of love is how you act towards others, treat others, with love, and if you can't pass that test of love, how can you pass more extreme examples? You may recall in church history, Acts chapter 15, the very first church council got together and they addressed a question, and the question was this, must a Gentile become a Jew in order to become a Christian? And the answer was no. In the sight of God, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile when it comes to condemnation or salvation. God is very clear in these scriptures. God looks beyond social, economic, and racial differences. In Christ, masters and slaves are equal. Rich and poor are equal. Male and female are equal. Gentile and Jew are equal. That's how God views this. God just says, even in in broad groupings of people, there is no favoritism. Uh, I would say this, going back to verse 5, is the grace of God makes the rich man poor, and it makes the poor man rich. Let me try to explain that, because I think that's what James James wants us to hear. Is the rich man is poor, why? Because he can't rely on his money or her money to earn favor with God. 
he has got to, he's got to just say, no, all of that is set aside. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? And so that's what the grace of God does. It makes the rich man poor. But the poor man is rich because he can't rely on his riches, All he's got is to lean on the grace of God. And that's what James wants us to understand as we interact with and view other people. Let me wrap this up, these last two verses. Verse 12, speak and act. And those are key words. You may want to underline them or highlight them in your Bible somehow. Speak and act. As, though who are, as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Why? Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And of course, when you're showing favoritism, you're judging without mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, let me break out these two words, speak and act. Speak. The point there is your words will be judged. What you say to people and how you say it will come up before God. Are your words equally full of grace no matter who it is you're talking to? Be it a homeless person, to somebody um, extremely famous and well off. Do you have words of grace to either one? Do you love each equally? See, words, that's what God knows. Word come from the heart. And when God judges, he's examining the heart. He's examining what's going on inside. I love what uh, Eugene Peterson wrote the Bible in uh, a translation called The Message. It took him 20 years of his life to do this, but the message in Matthew 12, 36, and 37 said this. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can be your damnation. How's how's your words towards others? And then this idea of act. Your actions will be judged. How you act towards another person whether you're giving preferential treatment or not. James contrasted this, we saw, by showing mercy to others and refusing to show mercy to to others as well. And he says that when you are treating people with mercy, um, there is a law that's involved, and it's the law of freedom that allows you to walk in liberty. Imagine this, when you're freed up from all of the the worldly norms or the worldly standards of how the world judges people, when you're free from that, you can just see into somebody's heart and you can see their potential. You can look beyond the outward appearance. There's a freedom in that. I love what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119.45. He says, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. And the precept we're hammering this morning is favoritism, not showing favoritism. When you can learn to master that, when your faith is mature to do that, I guarantee you, you get a taste of freedom that you previously did not have. I guess the point is, as you mature in the faith, your beliefs should determine your behavior. Faith impacts love. Your faith impacts love. If you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that God is gracious, his word is true, that one day he'll judge you, then your conduct should reveal your convictions. So what James does here, he actually commands the brothers and sisters. He commands you to accept others consistently with courtesy and compassion. I can tell you this, if you're one to to look at the outward appearances and get stuck there, you're like the person sitting on the couch making judgments and calling out the good plays and seeing the bad ones. And and James, James is your coach saying, would you get up off that couch? Would you get up off that chair and get in the game and start loving impartially, loving 
with mercy, loving, looking at somebody's potential, not their past. That's the message of this first half of James, chapter 2. There's a lot there. And I would ask that you would allow that to really penetrate and soak in and allow it to, to change your perspective on other people, whoever they may be. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for this message from James. And it's clear, Lord, that this was a big issue. It's a big issue back in that day. It's a big issue today. So much so that we see uh, a good uh, half of this chapter devoted to it, Lord. And I pray that you would help each of us to mature. That all that are hearing this message, God, that they would become more impartial in in how they interact, speak with others, and act towards others. May our actions be full of grace and mercy and love. And God, we know that that would honor you. And that, God, I've, I've heard it said, I heard it said this week that there's actually five Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, and John. And then there's your Gospel. You, there's my gospel, the gospel that I show, because people are going to be reading me and people are going to read you. And when they read you by looking at your words and action, will they see grace and mercy and love? God, help us not to forget to, to live this, this own gospel that people are reading right from our own lifestyle. So God, to you may be all the glory. I pray that this message will take root and make a difference in people's lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.